If the universe is really just made out of waves and particles and energy and matter, all the things that physics describes, how can we reconcile this with the experience of being a human, the subjective nature of our consciousness, and the experiences many people share that they describe as spiritual experiences? Today on our show, we're discussing these big questions with a special guest, Alan Lightman. Alan is a physicist with a materialist view of consciousness, but who has found a way to reconcile his view of spirituality with it as well. This episode of Why This Universe is supported by Wondrium. Wondrium offers thousands of video and audio courses on a huge range of topics. I've been listening to Wondrium for years, and I've enjoyed courses from them on topics from philosophy and history to literature, math, and science. One of my favorite courses in Wonder Room right now is called Modern Political Tradition, Hobbes to Habermas. Um, this uh, series of lectures covers the philosophical foundations of government and society, including the social contract, the rights of individuals, and the ethical basis for things like law and punishment. So if you want to know more about political philosophy, or just about anything else, check out Wonder Room and give them a try. You can sign up for Wonder Room right now through a special URL and get a free month of unlimited access. Uh, just go to wondrium.com slash universe. That's W-O-N-D-R-I-U-M dot C-O-M slash U-N-I-V-E-R-S-E. You're listening to Why This Universe, a podcast where we break down the biggest ideas in physics. I'm Shalma Wegsman. And I'm Dan Hooper. On this episode of Why This Universe, we have a very special guest, Alan Lightman. So Alan is one of these rare polymaths that is both a scientist and a scholar of the humanities. There aren't many of us out there, um, but Alan is a a rare example. Uh, He's been on the faculty of MIT and Harvard. He is uh, one of the authors of the famous Radio Processes book that every uh, astrophysics grad student goes through in in their studies called uh, the Rubicki and Lightman textbook. He's done a lot of important work in his early career on accretion disks and relativistic plasmas in the field of high-energy astrophysics. And today we're going to talk with him about the interface between spirituality and science. Um, he has just written a new book called The Transcendent Brain, Spirituality in the Age of Science on this topic. And he has a new PBS series uh, called Searching, Our Quest for Meaning in the Age of Science. And we're going to talk with him about those themes today. Welcome, Alan, to Why This Universe. Thank you, Dan. Um, uh, so do you... Th- when you have a title, why this universe, does that imply that, that there are other universes? <laughs> <laughs> I guess to me, it implies that it could have been a different universe. We have a few episodes about the multiverse, though, <laughs> so so maybe. Yeah. Okay. I consider it a debatable point. I'll put it that way. <laughs> so, Alan, in your new book, um, you describe yourself as a spiritual materialist. I can imagine there might be some people out there who would consider that to be a contradiction in terms. What do you intend to convey with that phrase? I think that many people, certainly most scientists, are materialists and that they believe that the world is made out of material atoms and molecules and nothing more, no non-material essence. But I also think that that all of us have... Uh, transcendent and spiritual experiences like feeling connected to nature or to other people, uh, an appreciation for beauty, a feeling that there are things much larger than ourselves. And so that's, that's my definition of, of spirituality. And, and there's no conflict between that definition of spirituality and, uh, a scientific materialist view of the world. So you would have a view where maybe maybe I have a transcendent experience. I, I uh, listen to a piece of music and it really moves me in some way that I might describe as a spiritual experience. But all that really boils down to a bunch of complicated interactions between atoms in my brain or something. Something like that is what you have in mind. Yes, yes, yeah. that, that's that's what I mean. So can I ask if it's also something physical then about the music that would induce the transcendental experience? 
Well, I think that the music appeals to certain parts of the brain that constitute our emotional apparatus. So, of course, music and everything else is is physical. Uh, music literally is a bunch of sound waves going through the air, uh, making molecules move back and forth. But that's not what causes a, a, a soaring feeling when listening to music. It's, it's the reception of those sound waves and their processing in the part of our brain that evolved millions of years ago and was very uh, tuned in to sound, probably initially as a survival mechanism. And then, of course, as a, as a byproduct of that, you would cert develop certain aesthetic sensibilities. I have been around a community of more or less materialistic friends and coworkers and things for long enough now that I'm super comfortable with the idea of everything in the universe being materialistic. Like that, that's super intuitive to me at this stage of my life. Um, but I have to pause every once in a while and think back and, and take notice of the fact that throughout human history, there've been a lot of great thinkers who have not endorsed that that perspective. Um, there are a lot of dualists and and or mind body dualists or, or other sorts of perspectives. And like these these philosophers and thinkers have put forth various kinds of arguments for dualism. Um, have you fa ever found any of those arguments to be compelling? Have they challenged your materialist view? Um, and if so, like which, which do you find to be most compelling or, or do you just find the materialistic arguments or the arguments in favor of materialism to be uh, open and shut case? Well, let me first clarify what, what I think you mean by dualism, that mind and matter are two separate substances and that, that mind, which includes our thoughts and memories and so on, is some non-material substance of some kind. It's not made out of atoms and molecules. Dualism, as defined that way, is only one part of a larger view of spirituality, such as belief in the soul, belief in the afterlife, belief in heaven and hell. Those are all, all non-material things as well as the mind. So the mind is, is one piece of this much larger non-material world. But, but your question was specifically about the mind and of course, I think Descartes was one of the most famous people to put forth the idea of dualism. I've looked at his arguments and I don't find them con convincing. I think for, for modern scientists and certainly for neuroscientists, there's no distinction between the mind and the brain. There, there's one thing that's up in our head, roughly three pounds of stuff, and it's a, it's a material thing with with uh, brain cells called neurons and connections between them. And uh, I believe, and I think many scientists agree with me, that all of our thoughts, uh, memories, uh, everything that we associate with, with mind originates in the chemical and electrical interactions between those material neurons. So I, I have looked at, at the arguments of the dualist and in every case I find a flaw. So one of Descartes' principal arguments for the existence of a mind separate from the body is that in order to have a lot of parts working together, you need some kind of supervisor to organize and supervise those pieces, those, those thoughts or whatever. And the combination of those uh, individual physical processes just by itself does not produce sort of the qualitative phenomena that we associate with thoughts, memories, and everything else associated with mind. The problem with that argument is that we know that a system of, of many parts does not necessarily require a, a, a super organizer to produce new qualitative phenomena that the manner in which many individual parts can produce a phenomena that's not qualitatively apparent in the individual parts is called emergent phenomena. It actually has a name, and uh, an example of emergent phenomena is the way that if you, there are certain species of fireflies that when they find themselves together in a, in a field on a summer night, they, they initially begin blinking at random, but after a, a minute or two, 
they're all blinking in synchrony. And you, you couldn't predict that behavior on the basis of analyzing a single firefly. So the analogy to the brain is that the brain is made out of 100 billion fireflies like neurons, and you can examine individual neurons and, and know everything about them, the way they work, their electrical and chemical activities. But the, the action of, that, of those 100 billion neurons working together produces a totally qualitatively new experience that we call consciousness. And because there are many physical systems that we now know that do this kind of thing, you, you do not require some non-material supervisor to make that happen. So that's my problem with, with, with Descartes' uh, principal argument for, for dualism. So as a somebody in, with a more modern perspective than was available in Descartes' age, I have, an, I have another point of, like, frankly, confusion about the dualist perspective. Like, you know, as a modern physicist, I, I don't think everything's made of the same stuff. I mean, there are atoms, but I also study dark matter and whatever dark energy is and stuff. And, like, so I'm open-minded to there being a variety of things. Light is a different kind of thing than atoms are and whatever. But um, if if you told me there was something that was interacting with the body conveying like thoughts or consciousness or something, I would be inclined to like posit new forms of matter or fields or something. And, and just think of them as a different kind of materialism. What, what does somebody like Descartes mean when they talk about there being something that interacts with the material world that isn't material? Like what, what, what could that even look like what would what would prevent that thing from not being a type of material structure well i i i agree with what what you're implying with your comment which is that that anything that that interacts with the material world has to have material consequences right and and the 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 various energies that that physicists deal with like light and dark energy and so on those are all material things. Um, even though they're not the same as atoms and molecules, they're material in the sense that you can localize them. You can put a box around light and say what's in, what's in the box is light and what's not in the box is not light. You can quantify them. You can write equations for them. Uh, so they're, they're on the same footing as atoms and molecules. So when I, when I talk about material things, I include the, the kinds of energies that, that scientists and physicists deal with. They're localizable, they're quantifiable, right. and so on. That's not what Descartes and, uh, belie believes about the mind. It's not what people believe about the soul. It's not what people believe about the afterlife, and so on. Those things are not localizable. They're not quantifiable. Um, I respect those beliefs, because after all, more than 50% of the world's population believes in the soul, more than 50% of the world's population believes in some kind of afterlife. Uh, I respect those beliefs. Uh, I just don't happen to share them myself. <laughs> so, so maybe we can d just to think of this uh, dualism, this dichotomy as things that are and are not accessible through the scientific method. Is that one way to think about it? Well, th th that's certainly one way to think about it. It's, it's, it's not, you know, there's more to it than that, but certainly that's true, that they're not accessible by the scientific method for sure. Yeah, Alan, in your book, one of the points you make in, in the arguments you, you present is that it's possible or maybe likely that human beings acquired consciousness through natural selection, through evolution, um, and somehow the ability to have first person experiences that we think of as conscious experiences, uh, gave us competitive advantages over, uh, other maybe early proto human like beings that didn't have that capacity. What kind of advantages do you think might arise from having first person conscious experience? And how do you think this might have played out in the evolutionary landscape? Well, first of all, um, consciousness is a graded phenomenon. You know, it's not an all or nothing thing. Uh, sure. Uh, uh, 
crows, dolphins, chimpanzees have, have some level of consciousness. They're probably not at the human level, but there's some levels of some level of consciousness. So it's a graded phenomena to begin with. My view is that consciousness, or at least the, the high level of consciousness that human beings have, is a byproduct of other mental abilities that did have direct uh, survival benefit. And uh, there's a lot of discussion about uh, characteristics, features, abilities that, although do not have direct survival benefit in themselves, are byproducts of those that do. And as far as consciousness goes, and we're talking now about a high level of consciousness that humans have, that is self-awareness, uh, memory, ability to plan the, for the future, and so on. To me, those abilities are byproducts of a brain with high intelligence. And we know that the size of our brains, of our human brains, from, from archaeological, anthropological uh, studies, the size of the human brain, which is by far the largest of any animal of our size, it increased enormously from about 800,000 years ago to 200,000 years ago. And that was a period of time in which the, the environment fluctuated rapidly. And the, the hypothesis is, which is very plausible, is that the reason why our brain capacity increased enormously during that period of time was that we needed higher capacity in order to adapt to changing environmental conditions. And then once we had that large brain, then there were all kinds of byproducts of that. And some of the higher aspects of consciousness probably are byproducts of that large capacity brain, which was developed as a survival mechanism. So maybe consciousness or first person experience just kind of uh, grew out of increasing brain capacity. Yes, yes. So do you think it's plausible that there there could have been an evolutionary trajectory where there were organisms that could kind of solve the myriad of problems that Homo sapiens could without developing the kind of first person conscious experience that we have? Um, that's a great question. Uh, I don't know the answer to the question, but but my conjecture is that once you have a brain capacity as large as the one that we have, that a first person experience would be an in inevitable consequence. And you've got a hundred okay. billion neurons that are all talking to each other, right? And you're bound to get a lot of very unusual qualitative phenomena out of all of that traffic. So, um, although I don't know the answer to your good question, um, I, my, my guess would be that the, the first person consciousness, the first person experience is, is an inevitable consequence of sufficiently large brain. And that also raises the question of whether a, a computer right. could be conscious. Of course, AI is in the news recently in the last few months with chat GPT. And certainly we're going to be able to build computers with larger and larger capacity. And if consciousness is an inevitable consequence of a large number of neural like units in communication with each other, then a computer of the future might have all the attributes of consciousness. Whether it's actually conscious or not is something that we can't know because we can't ever know what it feels like to be a computer. Sure. But any, any finite list of attributes of consciousness, like the ability to memory the, mem remember the past, the ability to recognize yourself, the ability to express emotion like anger and love, um, the ability to plan for the future, any finite list of attributes of consciousness, I think that at some point in the future, a computer will check all the boxes. So like uh, philosophers of the mind sometimes debate this uh, question of the, the sub substrate issue with, with consciousness. And, and some have taken the side that as long as the information is being processed the same way, if consciousness can arise in a human brain, then it could arise on a computer made of silicon or whatever. 
And then other people have argued the opposite view that something about human experience, human consciousness is specific to the kind of material that the human brain is built out of. It sounds to me like you're taking a uh, substrate independent uh, perspective that you could have the kind of consciousness that we ha we have encoded on silicon chips or something. Yes, I, I, I do take that point of view. And, you know, let's say 100 years from now, when we have a, a super, super chat GBT that is performing all of these amazing tests, we still won't know whether it's actually conscious. Right. Today's episode of Why This Universe is sponsored by the International Space Station. Every day, 250 miles above our planet, amazing research and technology development to benefit humanity takes place on board the International Space Station. From improving quality of life for cancer patients to one day manufacturing artificial tissue and organs in space, we're enabling a broad community of dreamers to solve some of the world's most pressing challenges. How can you begin your journey and gain access to this ultimate research and development environment? Attend the International Space Station Research and Development Conference in Seattle, July 31st through August 3rd. Learn how leaders in academia, industry, and government agencies are seeing the value in space-based research and development to advance fundamental science, technological innovation, and in-space manufacturing. This is your opportunity to network with trailblazers in the space community and hear firsthand from those who have already conducted research on station. Join the ISS National Laboratory this August in Seattle at the 12th Annual ISS Research and Development Conference. Visit issconference.org to register now. So the, the famous criteria lay, laid down by Alan Turing um, was that so long as something can uh, communicate with you for a very long time and you feel they are conscious, it, it comes across like it appears they're conscious after a lot of interactions, then you should treat that thing as if they're conscious um, because there's no way to know more than that, uh, no way yeah. to find out at a deeper level than that. I guess that's what we do with normal human beings too, right? I don't really know for sure that either of you are conscious, um, but you sure seem like you are to me. So um, I proceed well, you know, that way. That's the nicest compliment I've had in a long time. <laughs> High I, praise. I seem, I seem to you like I'm conscious. Thank you. If you know, Alan, you can take it one of two ways: either you're conscious, and or um, you're so good at faking it. That, you know, you should be, you know, your, your programmer should be praised. Um, well, that's also a compliment to my programmer. <laughs> but, you know, that when we have this, this advanced computer of the future, this super, super chat GPT, and it, it has all the, the manifestations of consciousness, do we have any ethical and moral responsibilities to such a thing? For example, would we have to ask it permission to unplug it? Mm -hmm. mm. And so all, all of these questions are going to arise. And I know that, that ethicists are having a heyday on, on, on these advanced AI and what, what's coming in the future. Like when, when do they get the right to vote? Right. And uh, et cetera, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. Sure. All, all of that. Yeah. I mean, do you think that there's some threshold that because we did you did kind of mention this idea of kind of levels of consciousness right so like maybe a firefly has some level of consciousness but not the same as a human of course right so do you think there's like some threshold where like if you cross that amount of consciousness or like that brain size or however you want to put it that like then you we have that moral responsibility well, it's, a, it's a great question and you know i don't i don't know where to, to draw the line it's, it's mm -hmm. a great question um I mean, people already kind of have that question just with animal rights, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, like, that's right. People, that, yeah. That, that's right. So the question has come up before, and uh, it's, it's a very, very difficult question. Uh, you'd have to have a very clean criterion, mm -hmm. and uh, we don't really know what that is right now or whether even such a criterion exists, but it's a great, it's a great question. Or right now, it still seems like a subjective, like each person has their own, like, oh, maybe I'll eat 
chickens but not cows or like maybe i won't eat any creatures um, right. and it seems like all kind of valid and like people like it doesn't seem like there's a clear moral hierarchy there um at least to me but right in the, in the vague statement like that um yeah there's of course yeah everybody has their own individual view but but my uh, amateur opinion is that when when computers get considerably more advanced than they are now that there will have to be uh, laws, there have to be legal structures to regulate the way that we interact with those entities. So it won't be just a matter of individuals making up their own opinion about whether they should eat chicken or fish. I think there are actually going to have to be new laws to govern our interaction and communication with these advanced entities. Hmm. So I, I, I agree that something like that would be called for. I'm skeptical that it would be put in place just from our human history doesn't look very good um, from the perspective of our uh, let's say sharing power of people who aren't very much like the people who are in power um, mm -hmm. you know things have improved but most of human history has had power consolidated among a very small fraction mm -hmm. of people it, it doesn't seem like we'd be very likely to be reluctant. We, we wouldn't be very likely to share the power we have with uh, silicon beings or, or whatever you want to characterize right. them as. Well, we'll see. Um, <laughs> you know, th there might be a time where uh, silicon beings are running the show. Uh, yeah. There might even be, you know, people getting married to silicon beings. Mm. Uh, and, you know, I think the future is, is wide open with these right. very advanced. And of course, there have been many science fiction movies that have explored mm -hmm. the, the this situation of, of very advanced robots or humanoids that look human and 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 human beings having relationships with them. Uh, so the, the sci fi people are, are ahead of the curve on this thing. <laughs> Do you think then that leads to the next question of you know talking about this consciousness hierarchy and stuff? Um, where what if like maybe there was some evolutionary limit to like how big our brains could be for us to still function biologically, but like what if there's not as much of a limit or something with these computers? Like what if they kind of reach an even higher consciousness than we have? And well, quickly. Well, yeah, well, that's a, that's a very smart observation, and I think you're right. But maybe in that sense, we can think of the, the machines we build and the machines they build in the same way that Homo habilis might view us. You know, we, we can be the progenitor of this new great mm -hmm. thing. I mean, there's also, I guess, maybe, I guess this could be positive or negative depending on your perspective. But, you know, if we create an even higher consciousness being that maybe has like an even better than an intuitive understanding of things like taking care of the planet or like, you know, like taking care of big societies and stuff like that better than we actually are able to as human beings. Like maybe that would be a positive outcome, even if it means that we yeah. do relinquish our, our power as like the dominant species on earth, you know? Yeah, that's, that's a, that's a good point. And, and one uh, thought that that raises is that the, the violence that human beings do to each other, uh, which probably has lots of, causes i mean survival is one of them but probably a lot of other causes it's it seems to be very deep in human the human psyche because you know for, for all of recorded history human beings have made war on other human beings they they vied for power killed each other and all the other terrible things that we do to each other so it raises the question if you do if we are able to create one of these advanced computers that has all the attributes of consciousness will will some of our negative the human being negative uh qualities like are are prone to to violence and greed will those things emerge inevitably from a being with with an artificial being with with a high level of consciousness uh, are, are they are they inevitable you know, with a sufficiently large brain, these these negative qualities that we have. Yeah, the, the the most optimistic view I can take of all this stuff is the possibility that we could maybe end up being replaced by a 
system of intelligences that is more capable of having transcendent, wonderful experiences, the same sort of thing we value about human experience, but cranked up to 11, while also being able to function more rationally and responsibly in the ways that matter and um, reluctance to use violence being one of those things, but also just better stewardship of the planet and, and our resources and things like that. That would, that would be wonderful if that comes to pass. I would uh, cede humanity to that if if uh, yeah. if, if that were really I mean, an option. I feel yeah. like the problem is there are always some humans that would not cede, right? Mm-hmm. Like I'm, I'm imagining now a, a positive future maybe where like say we invent this super advanced consciousness that imagine it can kind of rule Earth, but in a way that actually satisfies all creatures needs and then humans like all of our needs are satisfied in this like higher consciousness earth where like we actually have like not only our material needs met but also our creative needs and like resources and like the ability to do everything we want to do but we have to relinquish the control over the planet to this higher species i still imagine that there'd be people who who would fight that system i don't think it's going to be up to us (laughs) no we, we've uh, we've meandered in, in this conversation, which has been great, but I want to bring things back kind of full circle to the, the very beginning of our conversation, Alan. Uh, we, you know, we opened by asking, you know, what you meant by spiritual materialism and, and like explaining why that isn't some sort of contradiction in terms. Um, if you, you know, I'm sure you, you've seen things online and things, but there's a lot of stuff uh, between some of the kind of the new atheist types and yourself where there seems to be a, a loggerheads, a, a mismatch between what you think some of the words mean and what they think some of the words mean. Uh, they seem to really object to any use of the word spiritual, uh, spiritualism, right? Um, can you say something about, you know, to what extent you agree or disagree with these, these guys, not just in terms of, well, both in terms of communication and, 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 and how, these things get discussed, but also like, are, do you have disagreements deep down about the nature of the universe or what's true and false? Well, I think that the new atheists and I see the world, the, the physical world, pretty much the same way. And I think the, the new atheists do acknowledge uh, n- a number of the experiences that I group together under the heading of spirituality such as the appreciation of beauty, uh, the feeling of being connected to nature, and so on. Where we differ, and I, I hesitate to group all of the new atheists together, uh, sure. but where, where I differ from the prominent new atheists is that, that they have a condescending view towards believers, uh, people who believe in God, people who believe in the soul, Um, They have a a dismissive and condescending view towards that group of people. And that group of people is more than 50% of the population of Earth. And um, my view, uh, my particular view is is that I respect those beliefs. I respect the belief in God. I respect the belief in the soul, uh, even though I don't share those beliefs myself. And there are many, many intelligent people who believe in God, who believe in the soul, believe in an afterlife. And we can't just dismiss all of that. You know, there there are reasons for those beliefs. Um, I don't think that science will ever be able to disprove the existence of God. And I don't think that religion will ever be able to prove the existence of God. These are things that we take on faith one way or the other. So to summarize, like when uh, Richard Dawkins or whoever some of these guys say that we shouldn't be using words like spirituality because they think they mean something intrinsically supernatural, and you don't, you don't mean that. You mean something no, purely, mean purely naturalistic. Yeah, yeah. I, and, I don't mean that. But but I think that the the Dawkins and Sam Harris and and other people in that group, it's not just the. The, the definition of spirituality where the where the disagreement is it's it's the actual attitude towards believers uh, yeah. which is I think the principal difference in, in what I object to mm-hmm. 
I think uh, being empathetic towards people you disagree with is uh, a lost a lost art in much of our world. Yes, it is. Another phrase you used in your book um, that I really liked was the the creative transcendent. Can you tell us what you mean by this phrase and how it connects to your view of how human beings relate to their world? Yes. Well, what I mean by that is the feelings and experience that we all have when we're, we're involved in a creative activity. And I think all of us have been involved in creative creative activities, whether you're writing a poem, creating a baby, listening to music. And during that, that experience, you lose a sense of yourself. You lose sense of, of your ego. You lose sense of who you are and where you are. And you're just part of this, uh, this magical world where your your yourself has di- dissolved and you've become you've joined with something larger than yourself and it's particularly powerful when you are creating something new that hasn't existed before and you know kind of a paradox there is if you're creating something new and of course every almost every poem is is a new thing whether it's good or bad um The paradox is that when you're creating something new, you are reaching deep inside your individual self. Uh, It's it's an expression of your individuality. And yet this feeling of transcendence, which is part of the creative transcendent, and that experience, you lose sense of yourself. You lose sense of your ego. Um, you're not aware of where you are or what time it is or whether this thing you're doing is going to be important. You're just in the zone. And so I think it's an interesting paradox uh, that that involves the self at a deep level, but it also involves the loss of self. Does this always... Um require a, a creative element or can it be a, can you be taking in art and experience this state that you're describing as well? Yeah, I, th- I think, I think you can be taking in art yeah. as well. I mean, it, it, you can be experiencing the creativity okay. of, of someone else. That makes sense. Um, yeah. yeah. But, but there is, there is a, a creative element in the experience, whether it's created by you or whether it's someone else, it, it's something something new is happening. There's a lot of beauty to that. It, it, you know, if, if you just described how natural selection works and how biology and organic chemistry and everything works, and I don't think there, there you would have any reason to deduce that out of that process would come organisms that are capable of the kind of transcendent uh, or spiritual experiences that we're talking about here today. Um, I, this goes back to this idea of emergence that, that you talked about earlier yeah. in this interview, but, uh, there's something really beautiful and powerful about how something mechanistic and straightforward, like natural selection can give rise to something. So, um, uh, I don't know. I don't even have the vocabulary yeah. for it, but, uh, this is yeah. so, so transcendent. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, let me make one comment, uh, that, that this this uh, consequence of what you just said, and that is that that I've read uh, I've read a, an interview with with one of the creators of Chat GPT, mm-hmm. and he he was describing his own amazement at the capability of this computer program. He, he said that that fundamentally that Chat GPT and and all of the similar uh, large language models that what they're doing is they're looking at large databases and seeing a string of words and then pre- using predicting what word comes after that string mm-hmm. by looking at an enormous database of sentences uh and and just seeing what words come after other words and sentences so it's basically a giant lookup table and what this uh i can't remember his name now one of the inventors of chat GPT said that he was amazed that just given that kind of mechanistic process, almost like putting one foot in front of the other, that the the program was able to to come up with such 
seemingly original right. ideas and expressions. So what you were talking about, the way that the, the brain works and, and the kind of a, a, a amazing qualitative phenomena of consciousness and everything that comes out of the brain, we're seeing the same thing happen already with, 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 with these computer programs we have now, and they're not even nearly as advanced as they're going to be 100 years from now. Yeah. Mm. With that perspective, maybe you could see the brain as just like a super, super complex lookup table that did emerge from it, emerge consciousness. Yes, you could do that. Yes, a super complex lookup table. <laughs> but you wouldn't make the distinction that like a chat GBT that's like, say, like even even more complex or something. You wouldn't make the distinction of saying like that's not conscious because it's just a lookup table. You would say it started as a lookup table, but it's so complex that there is an emergent consciousness. Yes. There's an, there, yeah, there's some emergent phenomena. Um, mm. So we're really at a turning point of technology. It, it's sort of like uh, the Industrial Revolution, mm. uh, where there's suddenly this enormously greater capacity to, to do things. Uh, and I don't think that anybody knows exactly where this is going to lead at the moment. As the old parables goes, uh, may you live in interesting times. And we certainly do. <laughs> we certainly do. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> Huge thank you to Alan Lightman for this great conversation today. If you want to hear more from him, you can read his latest book, The Transcendent Brain, Spirituality in the Age of Science, out now. Why This Universe is brought to you by the University of Chicago Podcast Network. It's edited and produced by me, Shalma Wegsman, and my co-host is Dan Hooper, a professor of astrophysics at the University of Chicago and Fermilab. If you like our show and you want to support us even more, you can find us on Patreon. There you can access ad-free episodes of the show as well as exclusive Ask Us Anything episodes where you get to ask Dan and I direct questions about physics or anything else. So if you are curious about that, you can find it at patreon.com slash whythisuniverse. Thank you so much for listening and for your support.